Hello, everyone. Um, I think we can get started. Thank you for attending uh, the presentation session two at the RDAP Summit 2022. Um, my name is Chao Tai. I'm the Planet Sciences Librarian from Purdue University and the moderator for this session. Uh, just some logistics. This is a Zoom webinar. Attendees are muted and your cameras are turned off. The session will run from 1.15 p.m. to 2.15 p.m. Eastern time with the last 10 to 15 minutes for questions. And uh, please use the Q&A at the bottom of the screen to ask a question and also please indicate the presenter or presenters you would like to direct your questions to. Uh, we will save all questions till the end of the, uh, till the, end of the session. And after the session, please feel free to drop questions and continue the conversation in the chat in Hoover. Um, before we dive into our awesome presentations, I want to remind everybody that the RDAP Summit organizers are committed to providing an environment where all attendees can participate fully in the program and activities without the fear of harassment or discriminatory behavior of any kind. Uh, there is a code of conduct helper available during this session. I'm Lee Kilser, who you can identify with the uh, code of conduct helper text next to her name. Uh, you may send direct messages to her in Whova if you need assistance, and she can give you the code of conduct email address or the link to the incident report form if uh, needed. So finally, we got to our wonderful presentations. Uh, first, we have uh, Rachel Woodward from University of Michigan talking about building a data lifecycle management toolkit to support diversity scholarship. Rachel? Did that work? Can, can people see my slides? Yes, we can. Awesome, thank you. Um, yeah, so hi, my name is Rachel Woodbrook. Um, I'm the data curation librarian at the University of Michigan, and I'm gonna talk about um, a project that we've been working on for quite a while now, um, building a toolkit centered around the data lifecycle and um, data management. But before I start, I wanted to mention that I'm on land belonging to the Coast Salish peoples, um, specifically the Duwamish, which is the host tribe of Seattle and King County. And if anyone else lives in the area or feels connected to it and hasn't yet heard about the Real Rent campaign, um, it's a material way to acknowledge and support the tribe who have been custodians of the land for thousands of years. You can also find out more about supporting their petition for state and federal recognition as a tribe um, at www.duwamishtribe.org. And my slides are not on Whova yet, but I'm going to try and drop in the chat here um, this URL so that folks, anybody who wants to follow along um, is able to do that. I also wanted to give um, a quick acknowledgement uh, wholeheartedly to the sponsors for our project uh, without whom most of what I'm gonna talk about would not have been possible. Uh, Lyricist's Catalyst Fund is an amazing opportunity and I encourage anyone with a wishlist project idea to consider applying for it. Um, and the ALA Office for Diversity, Literacy and Outreach Services also awarded us a diversity research grant that allowed us to keep on um, one of our amazing student assistants, Emma DeVera, to help with the toolkit creation and revision. Uh, there's a link here also to our entire team past and present on our website. So very briefly, the overall project uh, was based at the University of Michigan Library, and it was conducted in partnership with the National Center for Institutional Diversity, which is an organization supporting scholars doing diversity scholarship. Um, and that's a phrase that they've defined and talk about as scholarship um, that examines and seeks to affect social issues such as identity, representation, oppression, inequality at individual, group, community, and institutional levels. So that's um, a very broad definition. Um, and it includes people from all different um, disciplines as well. The first part of our project consisted of conducting qualitative and quantitative research with scholars who are part of a network created by NCID. And I've linked my slides um, from last year sharing some of those results. The second part that I'll focus on today was about building the resource. And the basis of this project or the need for it, um, it started back in 2018 was I've heard several other people mentioning in lightning talks and presentations already, 
a uh, recognition that there's a disconnect between a lot of our conversations about open data and opening data and changing data sharing requirements, and then commensurate support for scholars to feel confident sharing their data, knowing that they've been able to take all the necessary steps and feel that um, they're doing so appropriately. And at the time the project started, uh, there were almost no resources explicitly tying data ethics to the data lifecycle for management purposes. And that was a framework we thought would be useful. So the overarching question shaping the project was what implications do diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility considerations have for best practices in each step of the data life cycle? Very briefly, going over our results that informed the toolkit, one of the biggest findings, I don't think anyone will be surprised, was that respondents all wanted more support and they worried that even if an additional resource were available, they wouldn't have time or resources to invest the effort to use it. Um, so this research really helped clarify, again, something we probably all already knew, that there's a need for institutional, structural, and cultural change to support best practices around data ethics. Um, many researchers already feel overwhelmed, and unfortunately, the timelines and funding models of a lot of the systems are moving, but they're not, the overall culture is not supportive of truly ethical data practices, which require making space for slowness, maintenance, and investment in relationships that are not extractive. So these are not problems that can be solved on an individual level. And I wanna be sure to acknowledge that, but there are things we can do. And <clears throat> although we didn't see a correlation between um, scholar demographics and their desire for support or likeliness to use a toolkit, we did um, believe that such a resource would be especially useful for scholars earlier in their careers who had fewer resources at their disposal, maybe who aren't affiliated with an institution or scholars with minoritized identities that might leave them open to greater scrutiny or consequences, which is something that some of our interviewees expressed hesitation um, or as a, as a reason for hesitation around sharing their data. So our goal was to identify the most useful resources, match them up with what scholars said they needed and find a way to collate and make them available that was not overwhelming or difficult to wade through. So um, scholars could quickly and easily identify what resources might be helpful for them. We came up with some parameters for the toolkit based on our interviews. Um, basically what I just mentioned, we wanted a highly curated list that was easy to navigate. And we did an environmental scan of available resources online while we were doing our research. We ended up with about 60 resources to review. Um, and we were looking around from fall 2018 to spring 2020, we've continued to add to it. There've been a lot of things created since that time, obviously. Um, and I'd like to do a more comprehensive update, but that was enough. We decided for an initial launch of the toolkit. And then this is the research data life cycle, um, similar to many others you may have seen that we used as a structure for our project. So there's eight different stages. Um, and we talked about research data stages with the researchers because not everybody uses the term research data life cycle, but the first two finding data and data planning are sort of pre-project, the next three are during the project, and the last three are roughly afterwards. And then we coded each of the resources to various stages of the life cycle that we thought they would be useful for. And for inclusion criteria, we looked at each resource and tried to determine its applicability. Um, so does it either address particular needs of researchers working with diversity scholarship or um, is it created to address ethical or social justice issues raised when dealing with research data more generally? Accessibility, although we don't have a, a perfect way to assess um, like machine assisted accessibility, but all of them are openly available. Usefulness, um, whether it was uh, immediately useful and applicable and concrete, the scope and breadth. We wanted things that were applicable to multiple disciplines and research methods. Um, timeliness, when it was created, how often it's updated, being able to map it to data lifecycle stages, and we wanted to have representation of each stage. And then authorship, um, was it produced by a group or a person that was knowledge, uh, experienced or knowledgeable about DEIA issues and or diversity research? In the end, our first version of the toolkit that I'll show in a minute has 17 resources total. Um, our goal was about three to five for each stage, so 25 to 35 total. Um, both data sharing and data archiving and preservation, which were the areas of 
the research stages, research data life cycle stages that um, researchers indicated least comfort with are well represented. But you can see that there are only two resources on finding data, and those are actually the only two we were able to find. We do know of one or two others that are coming out um, that were specifically oriented towards those wanting to work with data that can be reused um, with an explicit framework um, around DEIA, and one of them is specifically anti-racism um, in data reuse. And similarly, we found very little on the accessibility of data as it relates to assistive technologies, even though that is something that um, did come up in our interviews um, and that people were interested in and concerned about. And I know there are some other folks here who are gonna talk about that as well, which I'm excited to hear. Uh, for researchers or for others, such as yourselves perhaps, who wish to dig deeper into the range of resources available, we do have access to the full Google spreadsheet with all the resources we identify that we're still working on. Um, and we also have a mechanism for suggesting additional resources. And there's a link in the toolkit. And I've also put a link to the form, in the slide notes here. This is what the initial version of the toolkit looks like. Um, I, it's not done yet. Um, and I think it looks like that, but it's okay. It's pretty basic. We have a few pieces of metadata visible and we have some more behind the scenes. And then we have filters for data stage format. So like document, website. Um, I think we only included one book and then uh, the date the resource was last updated. We ended up using Google Data Studio for the platform. And this had some advantages, especially since we didn't have a, bu a budget for web design or execution. Um, and it passed muster with our accessibility folks when we um, looked over it with them, but it's not the most intuitive tool to navigate, and it's more oriented towards um, the visual presentation and analysis of data. So it is a great tool for that if anybody is looking for such a tool, but that's slightly different than what we're doing. Um, so we had to spend a bit of time looking at the capabilities um, and how to adjust those for our use. And I did just want to share a few examples um, of resources. These are resources listed in the data sharing category. Uh, for example, the first resource listed here, the data ethics canvas, you can see that we have the title, um, the creators, the description, and then a little note about why we chose it and thought it was useful. And this tool um, I'm particularly excited about, it walks users through a series of questions in a table format to interrogate intention, potential uses, and consent of research participants to consider when preparing for data sharing. And so really, you know, right from the start. Um, and this corresponds quite well with the data sharing life cycle. Um, it's not repetitive, but it covers many different stages and it could be used by any researcher who intends or may want to share their data outside their project. You can see from the second resource available here that I've highlighted, the Equitable Open Data Report, that in some cases we had to go outside academia to find good resources. Um, and in fact, many resources come from a particular frame of reference, either focused on big data, um, potentially only applicable directly to indigenous data. Um, some are focused on open government data, such as this one, but they, we decided that some of those include perspectives and questions that are useful starting points that could be adapted to other situations as well. It was challenging to curate the resources. Um, there weren't a ton, but we were trying to create a finished product that's basically a little bit of a patchwork. Um, and our multidisciplinary and introductory level approach meant that many of the high quality resources we did find that are very relevant to the issues we were concerned with, for example, traditional knowledge labels for metadata might be too specific to include in what's a general access toolkit. And then some challenges that researchers undoubtedly need support with, like true data de-identification are just too complex to address in this type of resource. But I do feel that we are able to come up with a number of useful resources for anyone looking for an entry point or somewhere to direct others when questions arise. I was going to do some more talk about the platform, but suffice it to say, I'm not a web designer or a data visualization expert. There's work to be done, but a lot more time and effort went into building what I just showed you than it probably looks like. Uh, I do believe though that we're at a point now where the toolkit is usable and feedback would be really helpful. So if this is something that interests you, I encourage you to take a look and feel free to use it if it can be incorporated into your work or to send us any comments or suggestions. And this is just an idea of how we might 
continue to evolve it. Um, I'm going to continue working on improving navigation and visual formatting. Right now, it's basically just me. Based on the feedback we've received so far, you may revisit using the lifecycle visual as an entry into the toolkit. So then a user could select a lifecycle, such as a lifecycle stage, such as data sharing, and then be directed to something more like a web page um, with all the metadata we assigned to each resource displayed. Um, and this is just one resource. But these are the different um, pieces of metadata that we included. So next steps and beyond, once we complete collecting feedback and implementing initial revisions, we're going to be sending out a short feedback survey to NCID's Diversity Scholars Network to get additional impressions and suggestions from researchers. Um, the toolkit, the project and the toolkit were oriented towards diversity scholars, but I also anticipate that lots of us who work with people doing that kind of work and who maybe are doing that, you know, some of us here, I think, are also doing that kind of work will be interested. Um, and in terms of planning for the future, dissemination and incorporating the toolkit into use is a big next step, uh, a new phase that we're gonna um, need to, I think, think carefully about how we move forward. It'll be partly determined by what we hear back or how others wanna use the toolkit. And we're going to continue talking with NCID about effective ways to introduce the toolkit to their network. Um, I'm really excited to keep working on this and find out what shape it might take next. And it's going a little bit more slowly than I had hoped for various reasons. Um, but thinking sort of bigger and broader, in addition to the highly curated list, I think something like a broader directory could be useful and potentially manageable. Um, of course, sustainability is a big question. Um, we need to figure out what's manageable, potentially find some new partners. Um, I would love to find a way to crowdsource experiences with particular tools or facilitate rating them to get actual um, applied feedback and to make the tool more interactive to further engage the research community in academia and beyond. Um, we could also expand to include more research participant perspective and go beyond the academic setting. Um, sort of the, the stage that's not in our data life cycle there is the application and use of data. Um, overall though, the toolkit's not meant to be a static finished resource, but it's a catalyst for conversations and interaction and a tool where helpful for workshops, classes, et cetera. Um, thinking really big, I can even see this for some of the resources in it becoming incorporated more institutionally into approaches to data ethics and research education modules beyond the library's influence. Um, that would take a lot of additional work and buy-in. But when I think about what we've been able to do so far and the types of conversations that are starting to happen across the field, I think the shift is a matter of when, not if. So I'm excited to see if our work can be part of that progress. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel, for this fantastic uh, presentation. And for participants, please drop your questions in the Q&A uh, in Zoom or in Hoover. Uh, next up, we have um, we have uh, Kobe Willard-Wood from uh, Northwestern University talking about bringing your own data working groups, a new service to multiply staff impact and create community. Kobe. Hello, my name is Colby Wither Upwood. I am a data scientist at Northwestern, and I am going to be talking about a new service that we created during the pandemic. And so I actually work in the IT department. So I work in research computing services, and my side of the team is called data services. We have two and a half staff members, um, a lead, myself, and we have a half-time data visualization specialist. I also supervise a team of 10 student data science research consultants. We have three main service areas. So we do individual consultations, um, which are one-on-one -on -one meetings to discuss programming and data questions. We do a full workshop training schedule, and then we do special projects for faculty and staff when we have capacity. Um, and then, so I'm kind of telling you about this because it's why we um, kind of created this new service. We are kind of mandate is to serve anyone doing research at the university. So at all roles and across all schools and departments, Northwestern has three campuses and many professional schools and we help everyone. Um, we also work in this really great a library building on campus and we work closely with our colleagues at the library who are across the hall um, and we 
cross-promote services, especially with the GIS librarian and his team. Um, sorry. Okay, so these were the challenges that we were facing that led us to create this new service. So the first is not um, specific to the pandemic, obviously limited staff time. This is a problem for all of us. Also, we would all love to be experts in every language and every method so that we can help um, everyone whenever they have a question, but there's just not time for staff to train in those new methods. A big pandemic challenge we faced is that we basically lost all of our informal interactions with researchers. We used to do a lot of chatting after workshops. We would see researchers in the hall um, and at other meetings, and we lost all of that. So we weren't able to do that. And then we find ourselves repeatedly addressing the same data literacy issues in one-on-one -on -one consultations. These can be pretty general about shaping data, formatting data for analysis, um, but also other specific things that we just find ourselves telling people over and over again. And I wanted to give you one example. Um, one example I thought of was when we have a lot of people who come to us and say they want to web scrape a website, some obscure website to collect all the data. And the first thing we say is, have you tried asking the person who owns the website for the data? Um, so this is just something that we're repeatedly um, talking to people about. So our question was, can we help multiple researchers at once? increase um, the types of research that we can help with and create a space for informal discussion. At the same time, researchers are facing challenges, a lot of new pandemic challenges. They're having lim limited chances to get informal help, both from us and from their peers um, in their same lab groups. Also, any of, anyone who's done academic research knows that it is driven by hard deadlines. And so especially early on in the pandemic, there was a real lack of structure and accountability for researchers to make progress. We also saw a lot of field researchers having to pivot to computational work um, at, in the, during the pandemic. Then a big issue is that research labs are often in silos. So early career students um, often really rely on that within lab knowledge, right? They can go to a um, graduate student that's been there longer or a postdoc to find out which packages they should use, to find out what to do if their data looks a certain way. And they don't really do that across labs. Um, so is when I first started doing consultations at the university, I very naively used to ask students, well, what does your advisor say? Um, and they would say, I can't talk to my advisor about that, um, which was shocking to me. That is a problem I am not solving and it's kind of out of my scope. But being able to help with that was really a goal here as well. So the question is, can we help researchers increase productivity, get answers they need, and create accountability in their schedule? So we created a new service called BYOD Working Groups, Bring Your Own Data. And here are the logistics. These are weekly meetings. We are on quarters here at Northwestern, so these are eight-week sessions. You meet weekly in a group with three to seven participants led by a staff member. They're organized around a specific theme. So everyone's kind of working in a similar area or language. Each participant focuses on one single data project for the session. Before the um, eight sessions start, we give advice about creating a timeline for the project and breaking it into individual steps. And then we do a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the participant, um, the staff member does, to discuss their data project and walk them through that proposed timeline. During each meeting, we do two roundtables. The first is, what did you get done last week? The second is, what is your plan for the next week? So this is really creating that accountability, but also encouraging researchers to focus on their next step in their data project, um, rather than just seeing all of the work that needs to be done. This is followed by open discussion, which can go one of two ways, depending on how outgoing the group is. So. Um, in some groups, participants will have questions ready to ask the group. This can be things like, do you think my graph conveys what I'm trying to say? Does anyone use this package I'm about to start trying? Um, or does anyone know of a better way for me to do what I'm doing? And participants answer these questions and help each other out. If that doesn't happen, then it's up to the leader to kind of create discussion. And this can be around things like productivity. So what slowed you down this week? And then asking other people in the group, what do you do when this happens? 
And then also creating those conversations about data literacy, like I was talking about. Um, for example, I noticed two people mentioned that they clean their data by hand this week. Let's talk about when that's the best strategy and when it's not. So having those conversations with multiple people at the same time. We try to emphasize um, both before people sign up and during the session that there's no final project for these groups. We are not here to make any more work for anyone. Also encourage people to come to the group anyway, even if they got nothing done that week on their project. It's perfectly okay to say that. Everyone has weeks where they have other things that they have to deal with. And then reminding them that we can also provide one-on-one -on -one help as well. So if their question isn't answered during the group session, we can meet with them outside of that to help or have one of our data science consultants work with them. Some statistics, we've been, we started this when the pandemic started. We have uh, done this six out of eight quarters since then. We've ran 19 total groups with 101 accepted participants out of 180 applicants. Um, and we've learned and changed um, obviously through those six quarters. Our first quarter, we had undergrads in these groups as well, um, but we, um, had a lot of demand, so we kind of had to reduce um, who we could let apply. And we also found that the undergrad projects require more one-on-one um, uh, -on -one help, and so we're still working on a way that maybe we're going to adapt this for them. But you can see we have a lot of grad students, but also a lot of postdocs, staff, and faculty members in this group. Here are the themes that we've done for these groups. Um, so we do R and Python groups, but sometimes if we don't have enough people for both of those groups, we'll combine them together into a data analysis and programming group. Sometimes we have too many people in an R or Python group and we'll kind of split it up based on what type of work they're doing. We also do specialty groups. Um, I run a genomics group every quarter, working with genomics data, and we've done text analysis um, and web scraping group. And we always do a data visualization group as well. Here are some example projects that our participants have worked on, because um, I'm sure that's something that you're interested in. Um, and these, you'll see, they are, come from all across the university, all different types of projects and departments. So extracting and analyzing text from scanned French documents from the 19th century, um, building an automated pipeline, collecting and analyzing Twitter data is a popular one, um, analyzing some sort of genomic data to identify markers of some sort of disease. This is a common one in our genomics group. Visualizing industry trends and package size adjustments of consumer goods. That was a fun one in our data vis visualization group. Um, and then time series analysis of speech disruption patterns in Parkinson's disease. This is an example from one of our R groups. So these are just six of the projects and we've had over a hundred. So what are the benefits that we've seen? So these are benefits for us. The question was, can we help multiple researchers at once? Increase the types of research we can help with and create space for informal discussion. Definitely helping multiple researchers at once. We're also providing a level of project support for these researchers that we normally aren't able to provide. We normally don't provide this type of eight week follow through through an entire data project for our one-on-one -on -one consultations. It's usually a level we only provide on our faculty uh, projects, but because we have them in groups, we can do this. We're also able to leverage community knowledge to help a broader spectrum of researchers. So the first quarter we did this, we got a lot of applicants who are working on genomics projects, and we did not feel qualified to help with genomics projects at the time. But after I ran my first Python group, um, I realized that people are helping each other. So you have people at all these different levels, you have faculty, postdocs, who really are using their knowledge to help the other people in the group. So since then, I have been running a genomics group. And so we're creating that community um, and people are helping each other inside the group. At the same time, I am slowly becoming an expert in working with genomic data and methods because I am hearing about so many um, different data types um, and methods that they're using through these meetings, as well as so many different problems that they face. And finally, we have created that space for informal discussion and we're able to hear about issues and needs around the university that we otherwise wouldn't. So one example of this, I work in IT. So big project we had in IT recently was moving the entire university from one cloud file storage um, 
program to another, right? Um, another product. And so IT had to move every lab group's data, all of their data, um, and they did it in chunks. And I was able to hear from some of my groups about some labs that were having issues with this. They were having trouble finding the files um, once they had been moved or some things hadn't been moved. Um, and so I was able to connect IT with those labs um, to provide them a little bit of extra help. And that's just one example. So it is creating that informal space to kind of hear about what's going on at the university. There's also a lot of benefits to researchers. So the question was, can we help researchers increase productivity, get answers they need and create accountability in their schedule? Um, I talked about that kind of knowledge inheritance that only usually happens within a lab. And we've definitely increased that to across labs. So now we have a grad student in one lab who's able to get an answer from a postdoc who has the expertise um, in another lab where otherwise those conversations were not happening. So some actual um, data here about um, how researchers have benefited. We have had 23 repeat applications out of those 180. So a lot of people like it and keep coming back. We've also inspired some spin-offs. So we've had some participants in our group who have gone back to their own departments and created similar working group type, uh, type working groups in their own departments. So that's been great. And then we do surveys. And so we have gotten positive feedback on the surveys. 95% of the survey respondents said they would definitely recommend the program to a colleague. Then I have some quotes um, from those surveys as well. So people are definitely, um, they like the motivation and the accountability. Person said that it um, allowed them to work on a data set that they had been meaning to work on for a long period of time. People feel supported. Um, and they wish that they had this a group like this for every analysis project. And again, my name is Colby and I have my email here. Um, I'm willing to answer questions in the chat about this service um, that we created and also by email after the conference. Thank you so much for coming to our session.